Welcome to the Acupuncture Outsider Podcast. My name is Richard Hazel, and in the time it takes for you to commute to or from work, I hope to have shared something of interest about orthopedic acupuncture using motor points, trigger points, myofascial slings, uh, neurofunctional acupuncture, segmental treatments, anything that crosses my mind that seems to be of interest. I hope you'll enjoy it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Acupuncture Outsider. This is Richard Hazel and today I want to talk about tonic and phasic muscles and uh, the Yonda's crossed syndromes, the upper and lower cross syndromes. I probably won't go too in depth on the cross syndromes, but 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 knowing that those uh, cross syndromes are the way that I begin an assessment, meaning those are my guide. Uh, it's important to understand tonic and phasic. Uh, some people say postural muscles and phasic muscles, but tonic muscles and phasic muscles. There, it really has to do with their propensity to either shorten or become inhibited. Um, the tonic muscles are more the postural muscles. The ones that have to hold your head up all day are going to be tonic muscles. The soleus, which keeps us from falling forward onto our face, is going to be a tonic muscle that does not fatigue or does not fatigue quickly. Um, they What they know from studies is the tonic muscles have a higher percentage of slow twitch fibers than fast twitch fibers. Whereas the muscles that are prone to becoming inhibited have a higher percentage of fast twitch fibers and a lower percentage of slow twitch fibers. Now we will often see muscles that are both uh, tight and inhibited the TFL, for instance, you'll find the TFL not only gets short like a tonic muscle should, but also can become slightly inhibited. So even though it's firing, the weakness in the TFL you'll find is not only because of muscle shortening, but because of inhibition, muscle inhibition. So what you'll see, you know, the the tonic muscles are prone to shortening because of the slow twitch fibers. They will they tend to get stuck short. Um, postural muscles like hip flexors, we're sitting all day. They're in a shortened position all day. They will stay short. Uh, phasic muscles like the gluteus maximus, power muscle, will become inhibited. You won't find a lot of people who have um, hypertonic gluteus maximus. It becomes flaccid and weak. Um I believe a lot of the phasic muscles are being inhibited from reciprocal inhibition, from their antagonists being tight and short. Postural muscles are prone to shortening. Those are my go-to for pain. And so if you think about it, if you know nothing about Yonda's upper cross syndrome or lower cross syndrome, um, but you work with people um, you work with bodies, massage therapy, physiotherapy, acupuncture. You're probably aware of muscles that are prone to getting tight and pr and muscles that are prone to getting weak. Uh, I believe the gluteus maximus is primarily being inhibited neurologically by its antagonist hip flexors, especially the psoas. The psoas is a core stabilizer and uh, trunk and hip flexor. So it, it's, real, it's postural. It's, it's the intrinsic stabilization system that, that core stabilizes us. It interdigitates with the diaphragm. So uh, breathing patterns can affect the psoas, can start to tighten the psoas. Um, sitting a lot can tighten the psoas. Lots of uh, explosive movements can tighten the psoas. It doesn't have to be hip flexion. It can be deadlifts that will tighten the psoas because of the spinal erectors pulling the spine back. 
the psoas has to uh, dynamically stabilize the spine uh, by pulling forward. So you'll find explosive movements in, in either direction can affect the psoas and cause it to tighten. So why is this important? When we think of pain, we should be considering what whatever joint it is, what are the muscles that cross that joint and what are the muscles that are prone to shortening? So for instance, the knee. The rectus femoris is prone to tightening. The vastus lateralis, vastus medialis are a little more prone to becoming inhibited. Vastus lateralis, I will argue, has enough slow twitch fibers that it can also get tight. So it can be both. Vastus medialis, primarily you're going to find that it's becoming inhibited. Rectus femoris tends to be the, the tight, uh, short muscle that will put pressure on the knee, causing knee pain uh, and eventually arthritis, etc., tendonitis. Um, you'll find the patellar tendon is, you know, it's, it's a, it's a group of muscles, really. It's the, you know, it's the quad muscles. But the middle one is rectus femoris. And, you know, muscles cross joints. So when you're thinking about joint pain, you should be thinking, what are the muscles that cross this joint? When you're having patellar tendon pain, you should be thinking, what, what could be the cause? Very likely shortening up the chain. It's probably going to be mostly rectus femoris. You, of course, should treat all the quads but rectus femoris is prone to shortening. One of the main reasons rectus femoris is different from the other quads is that it's the quadricep that crosses the hip. So the upper part of the rectus femoris is a hip flexor, and hip flexors are tonic muscles. We know from Yonda's lower cross syndrome that the hip flexors get short. So that shortening of the rectus femoris is gonna put tension on the patella. Um, what are the other things about, let's talk about other things for knee pain. The lateral knee pain that people will have from the IT band. You have the iliotibial band. So it goes from the iliac crest down to the tibia. And it crosses the lateral outer part of the patella. And it's connected to the vastus lateralis and the biceps femoris. And it up in the upper part, it is an extension of the TFL. The TFL sort of turns into the IT band. You'll have it, um, it's contiguous, and the lower part of the gluteus maximus attaches to the IT band. And you have TFL is assisted by gluteus minimus. So gluteus minimus um, can, I believe, cause... Uh, greater trochanteric pain, and more IT band syndrome. So you have, you have gluteus medius that can affect the IT band because it's fascia lata. It's not, IT band's not like just this thin strip. It's the thickest part of the fascia lata that wraps the, the, the leg, that la wraps around the, the quad and the hamstrings all the, way, all the way around and up into the outer glute area. So the fascia lata is a really big structure, sort of sausage casing of the leg, helps um, blood circulation. You got to have a way to mechanically push blood back up to your heart, and the fascia lata helps to do that. But the thickest part of the fascia lata, the tensor fascia lata, tensor fasciae latae, sorry, my Latin's not always very good, um, is the thick part down the side of your leg that will help abduct and stabilize your whole hip and happens to also cross the knee. So the fact that it crosses the outer part of the knee, that will be a cause for patellar tracking issues causing lateral knee pain. Usually the eye of the knee, the outer part of the knee pain, of the outer part of the knee will hurt usually on squatting or going upstairs. Things that are involving the hip flexors and tensioning the IT band. So, so that lateral knee pain, if you're thinking about what crosses the joint, you're thinking about the IT band. And so when you know what are the muscles that are prone to shortening, 
TFL and gluteus minimus, and sometimes gluteus medius, by the way, it seems to be kind of 50 50, uh, 50% uh, short, uh, 50% slow twitch, 50% fast twitch. So I believe gluteus medius is this um, very special kind of muscle that is a power muscle, like the glute max, with a lot of um, the more fast twitch, and then also a lot of slow twitch that helps us to stabilize the hip. Um, you know, the Trendelenburg test, they consider that a glute medius test, but it really, in my opinion, it's all three. Um, you're really not going to fail a, a Trendelenburg unless your glute min and your TFL are also weak, sort of the three muscles innervated by the superior gluteal nerve should all, they will all be failing if you're, if you're having a Trendelenburg sign. So, um, so really I consider all three of those muscles, but when you think about the, the way it works, the, the glute medius has more propensity to inhibition than the TFL and the glute min. So to be the first to fatigue and then the TFL and the glute min, which are stabilizing the pelvis as well for runners, walkers, whatever, those will get tight. So this is why you see runners and cyclists with IT band syndrome more than your average person. Um, the average person could have lateral knee pain before they have IT band syndrome, but it's the same problem, different symptoms. You should still be thinking about, you don't have to have IT band syndrome to have lateral knee pain on squatting. You don't have to have IT band syndrome to have um, that knee pain going up and down stairs. But when someone does have IT band um, syndrome, they also will almost always have that lateral knee pain problem. Okay, so, but you, if you, you see what I'm saying about knowing what muscles are prone to getting short you know where to go. You know how to treat. Um, what's another good example? Okay, so why does the piriformis become such a problem? It becomes such a hip pain problem and sometimes a sciatica problem because it does not fatigue. It is postural. The piriformis, the gemelli, Obturator and turnus, though deep rotators are prone to shortening, they do not fatigue. Gluteus maximus fatigues. So what happens is glute max fatigues, and now piriformis and those other deep rotators are doing a lot more that glute max should be doing. So that could be someone doing squats at the gym, it could just be, it could be a 70 year old person going upstairs. When the glute max is shut off, piriformis and the deep rotators do more of the work for, for basically hip extension. Um, they are not hip extensors. They are external rotators and, and um, horizontal abductors, but they're also stabilizers of the SI joint. So because their role as SI joint stabilizers is being challenged by a weak gluteus maximus, they start to tighten to help, to help put tension on the sacrotuberous ligament to stabilize the SI joint. So no, they're not hip extensors, but they're going to get involved on hip extension because poor glute max is shut off. And it could be shut off for lots of reasons many times because of tight hip flexors, the lower cross syndrome that Yonda has um, given us, and very likely the psoas is the biggest one that is inhibiting glute max. So anything we can do to improve the pelvic um, alignment, to decrease the anterior pelvic tilt, can help the glutes to engage better. It helps the glute max engage better. Um, so Understanding Yonda's patterns and knowing which muscles are tonic and phasic is really key to knowing where to start for um, if you needed to do some muscle testing or, um, or you just have to treat because the person's in so much pain that you can't put them through muscle tests. I've had those people. You probably have to. They are in excruciating pain, sometimes it's back pain. 
They can barely move. They can barely get on the table. I am not putting them through muscle testing. I'm going to rely on experience and understanding of things like the lower cross syndrome and palpation. Palpation is a great, great guide. Do not underestimate the role of palpation in orthopedic assessment. Um, I think it's great if you know all the muscle tests. That's great. Um, You're not going to test your way into the right diagnosis. You can test your way into confirmation of the diagnosis that you already have in your head. But you can't just muscle test everything and then just treat everything that's weak. That's not the that's not how this works. And if you can imagine, um, if you're just doing muscle tests for like, uh, you know, if someone has uh, a tight psoas, um, anterior pelvic tilt, you're you're probably you you may miss you may miss the psoas being short if they happen to be an athlete. Um, there's a lot of people who have uh, short tonic muscles that will still be strong if they're an athlete, okay? Or what if you're treating someone who's older and everything's weak? Uh, they don't They don't have a constitution that's gonna allow you to treat every muscle, in my opinion, um, or at least I'm not going to. I really wanna focus on the tonic muscles that are causing pain. So if, if for instance, it's sciatica, um, ignore the low back just for the glute part, um, cause I would treat, I would treat, you know, L5, um, with electric stim, but not deep, just really superficial, just to kind of calm it down. I would probably be treating, um, QL and erectors if that is a problem. QL is almost always going to be tight on someone with sciatica because the psoas is tight, but you would, um, you, I could treat if you, if you said, here's four needles for this sciatica patient, I would choose Assuming I need to treat QL, I would treat QL, gluteus medius, piriformis, and the motor point of the obturator internus that also gets the two gemelli. That's if I only had four needles, that's what I would do. If you give me six, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go for the biceps femoris hamstring and the peroneus longus. You probably heard my whole, you know, spiel about sciatica, but um, I'm going to focus on where it's short and tight first. I'll worry about the uh, muscles that are inhibited later, especially after they've had a session with me and they're feeling better. They'll usually be more open to a bit more treatment because they know it works. Once they have confidence and it's not just a weird experience to them, then I can do more. Because if you th- put yourself in that patient's um, mind or experience, they've never had any acupuncture and you're putting needles into them and you're putting electric stimulation on it and they can feel the muscles moving. Um, for some people, it's very strange and they don't already have relief. So to them, it's just strange. You're basically doing something very strange to somebody and they have very little well, they might have faith because their friend told them to come, but the, in their head, they're still like, really, this is, re- you really, th- you think this is going to help? Um, so, so I kind of go easy on the first visit and try not to do too much and not to worry too much about the instabilities that led to this overuse injury of deep rotators, et cetera. So, um, and I will do so as on that person too. Um, I can usually walk them through why I'm doing it, why it's weird. (laughs) It's one needle. They're, you know, they're in a, they're in a supine position and their, their leg is under a big bolster and they're externally rotated and hip flexed a bit to make it really comfortable for me to, to go into that area. But I'll release the psoas on their first visit because I know that's going to help the anterior pelvic tilt that's, that's tightening the psoas and the deep rotators. So I will try to do that. Sometimes I'll even, if I'm, if they're feeling comfortable, I'll do the TFL glute man on their side as well. Cause eventually that has to be resolved because the external rotators are fighting the internal rotators. You just got to balance the hip, but you know, knowing what's tight really helps guide you. 
um, it really is going to give you an idea of where to start. Um, knowing the upper cross syndrome is so helpful. Understanding how tight the lats get, how tight the pecs get, um, how that internally rotates the shoulder, affects posture, affects the neck, puts you in a forward head placement, neck extensors, trapezius, how the trapezius can affect uh, the forward head placement, how the neck extensors affect the forward head, um, how that can affect migraines, just understanding the upper cross syndrome as a guide for where to look is so helpful. Um, and but the but knowing the cross syndromes um, is is really the guide to knowing what is a tonic, which muscles are tonic, and which ones are phasic. Um, and so you start with with the tonic muscles on a pain patient, and you work your way to the ph- the phasic muscles that led to the overuse injury, the the problem that they're having, um, that will help to focus the treatment because we only have a certain number of needles that we can really put into somebody um, and they're going to be comfortable with it. And if you are like I am and you have a limited number of leads uh, for your electric stimulation of those needles, then you still have to be really, um, you know, conservative with uh, where what you're treating and how you know how much you're treating, so getting the best result with the fewest number of needles is often um, how I'm looking at the first treatment, and uh, and really understanding the upper and lower cross syndromes is is my guide. Uh, it it tells me where to look, and I may muscle test to confirm, or I might do passive range of motion. So I really feel like a lot of times length testing tells me a lot more than muscle testing, especially for athletes, uh, because like I said, they're always, they're always strong. Even they're in, even they're inhibited and tight muscles are strong. So look at length testing for athletes because it'll give you a lot more, uh, information about what this athlete needs when they're, they could have super strong lats and still have short lats that are affecting their overhead reach. And if you have an athlete playing a sport where they need good overhead reach, then length testing of the lats is going to be a whole lot more important than a, than a muscle test, strength test of the lats. Um, same thing with their pecs. They could, they could have very strong chest. They could do great you know, um, presses and have zero pain. But if you do length testing of the pecs, you'll probably find shortening. And what is shortening going to do? It is going to inhibit, reciprocally inhibit the mid-back like the rhomboids. And it, it's putting a bit of an internal rotation on the shoulder too. And it, they may be young enough that you're not seeing that. They don't have poor posture. But... Yonda's upper cross syndrome applies to even a 23 year old with excellent posture. And that's the brilliance of understanding those syndromes is that you will find preemptively find shortening that is affecting their performance. Um, It's, I, I mean, it's, it's essential. If you're one of those people that just really loves to only work with like pro athletes, you still need to know Yonda's upper cross syndrome. It's not just for the olds. It's, it's, uh, it's for everybody. This is the human condition. So, um, anyway, so uh, I was thinking a lot about it cause I'm doing, uh, I'm doing an upper cross. Um, I'm, I'm doing a seminar in Sydney in March and, and it's really focused on, using the upper cross syndrome for shoulder um, assessment and treatment, using the lower cross syndrome for knee pain and how that guides us. So uh, it's just been on my mind and it occurs to me that I've gotten into a lot of treatment things, but I haven't really, I haven't maybe filled in a lot of the fundamentals that I think are really important for good assessment and treatment. And those are the things, you know, that, I, I think that's um, one thing that makes me a little bit different from some of the other people who teach motor points is that how heavily I rely on Vladimir Yanda and Carl Levitt's work from the Prague School. 
of rehabilitation. Um, to me, those two are just essential for for my assessment and treatment, and they deserve all the credit because uh, I don't think I would have ever rolled out of bed and understood tonic and phasic without you know without them having really delved into it and figured it out. So, um, so I wanted to talk about it and, and maybe there's some new people who are new to orthopedic assessment or maybe people in other manual therapy professions like massage therapy that this can give you another layer of understanding of like where to go, where, where to spend your time uh, when you're trying to help somebody. Um, sometimes helping somebody release their psoas is the best thing you can do for their low back pain and sciatica. So um, knowing those things is really the key. Okay, so that is uh, today's episode, and I will talk to you very soon. Have a good one.